How would you like to be persecuted simply for sharing your faith in a public place? We're going to talk about an actual case we're handling right now that deals with that topic in the second segment. But in the first segment, I want to talk to someone about something I just hoped I would not even be seeing or witnessing in today's society, and that is blatant anti-Semitism on a massive scale dealing with the European Union. Uh, we have with us here on the line uh, to discuss this matter, uh, Brooke Goldstein uh, of the uh, Lawfare Project, correct? That's right. Okay. Now, now Brooke, I, I hear that uh, the European Union is about to implement a, a policy that would uh, actually effectively be a boycott, actually put a, a, a label on all products that are imported from uh, the West Bank that are Jewish made, but not Muslim made. Is that correct? And if so, give us the rundown. Yeah, so, so sort of. So what we had today was a decision by the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is basically the Supreme Court of the EU, which issued a disastrous and frankly imprudent decision uh, that supported derogatory labeling that were imposed on Israeli products from the so-called disputed territories. That includes not just the area west um, of the Jordan River, but also apparently uh, sections of Jerusalem and also the Golan. And how this is going to uh, be implemented in practice is that Jews and Muslims living in the same geographic location are going to be subjected to different labeling requirements. And that's frankly, the definition of bigotry. Uh, what the court has said is we are going to now turn product labeling into political billboards that express the foreign policy whims of EU officials. And what's so disturbing is that the decision of the court is so broad that there are a couple of paragraphs that really don't even deal with Israel because in order to justify this, because right. uh, it's clearly discriminatory on its face, the court goes into the reasoning that you know, any consumer can object to labeling based on any ethical considerations whatsoever, whether it's social, political, legal, uh, you know, environmental. And so now the Pandora's box has been opened. Okay, so, so what does that actually mean? I mean, are we talking about uh, any product from any territory that's disputed uh, that... Uh, it has to have some kind of a, a, a label on it to stigmatize the product, so stigmatize uh, where it came from or the people that, that made it anywhere in, in the world if it's disputed territory. Is that what we're talking about? Yes, not only disputed territory, but if there's any ethical consideration whatsoever, environmental, political, social, legal, a, a consumer can now bring an action, for example, that requires oil produced in Iran say that Iran executes homosexuals. Goods produced in China say that China detains political pr prisoners. Shrimp from New Caledonia be labeled French colony. Products from Quebec, you know, indicate whether they be made by English or, or French speakers. Uh, this is total chaos. Um, and the only way to really fix this problem is for the EU to change the trade regulation that resulted in this really imprudent and short-sighted decision by the court. Right. So what's the U.S. position on this? We know what the EU is, is trying to do here, basically uh, uh, stigmatize and punish and, and Israel uh, in particular and people and Jews in particular who make products uh, and uh, in the, the West Bank and some of these, these places in old Jerusalem and Golan Heights. What, what's the U.S.'s position on this? U.S. is pro-Israel, right? So what are we doing? It's not just pro-Israel. I think mean, Israel is our only real ally in the Middle East, and the United States is also adamantly against against discrimination, um, as should the EU. And you know, it's quite obvious that the application of this decision is going to is going to trigger uh, U.S. anti boycott law and, and potentially disrupt U.S. EU trade relations. And we've seen already very high ranking U.S. senators and and representatives, both Democrats and Republicans, have issued letters. Uh, warning of the negative implications for trade relations between the United States and the EU. 
Uh, Robert Menendez, Senator Menendez, for example, has said that, quote, the decision will create policy tensions with the United States. What starts with Israel and with the Jews never ends with Israel and the Jews. And in order to justify this discriminatory policy, the court had to basically open up the Pandora's box now of politicized labeling, which will either throw the EU uh, market into total chaos based on the whims of any consumer uh, that decides to challenge labeling, or it will um, mandate that the law and the regulation is changed. Wow. Yeah, this is really alarming because I I don't think I've seen such blatant anti-Semitism uh, than this, than having to have a special label, uh, not from where it's from, but from the people uh, occupying. So if it's from a Muslim from the West Bank, there's no need for a, you know this kind of punitive label. Bob, but if it's made by a Jewish person living on the West Bank or in the Golan Heights or in uh, West Jerusalem, uh, then we need to stigmatize those people and, and make sure that this is labeled uh, in a very political way uh, to punish those people trying to earn a living uh, because of the uh, heavy bias uh, that's taking place. You know, I know a lot of countries in, the, in Europe today uh, have a, a heavy Muslim influence in their politics. I mean, it's, it's, you can't escape it, whether you're talking about the United Kingdom, uh, France. Uh, and yet we're seeing potentially other countries being brought into this as well that could, I mean, this could really hurt Israel's economy, Right. I think it's going to hurt the EU more than it's going to hurt Israel because we have shown, polls have shown that the labeling of Israeli products have in no way any effect on consumer choice whatsoever. So it's just a farce. It's politicization. It has nothing to do with consumer protection. On the other hand, it's going to hurt the EU because, again, it opens up the Pandora's box that, you know, of total uncertainty that any person importing uh, or exporting to the EU from any country in the world now does not know if their good is going to be accepted or rejected from one day to the next, what the labeling is going to say. And to your earlier point as well, in terms of anti-Semitism, it's clear. I mean, the, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, the IHRA definition, which is widely accepted, which I think was actually just adopted by Greece today. Uh, mm. says that a contemporary example of anti-Semitism is applying a double standard by requiring of Israel behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. And so far, no other democratic nations are, are being treated in this way, according to uh, uh, the EU. And unless they do, um, again, they're going to run afoul of IHRA or they're going to throw their own market into chaos. And the effect, again, of the decision is that Jewish products will be labeled differently from Muslim products because the court itself said that Jews, okay, aka Israelis, living in the so-called disputed territories like, under the same Oslo Accords as the Palestinian Muslims are foreigners, are illegitimate. But yeah. Palestinians are illegitimate. Yeah, and, and I, I think I find that highly alarming also in that uh, we're not talking about uh, products that are uh, coming from, say, uh, you know, the, uh, the Gaza Strip, where uh, we have Hamas terrorists dominating, occupying, and uh, a, 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 an enemy, not just of Israel, but of the United States. And we're not, we're not talking about uh, labels saying, uh, you know, this product comes from uh, Hamas-controlled uh, uh, Gaza Strip. We're talking only about a policy that seemingly is dealing with disputed territory or um, or is inequality, but it's really only just really targeting Israel, and that's that's the the double uh, hit here is the fact that uh, you know first the policy on its face is very arbitrary, but the fact that we really only see it being applied to Israel shows that it's really just a a pretense for anti-Semitism, and I think that's. That's what a reasonable person would have to conclude in view of all of the tyranny around the world and the fact that Israel is the only one, uh, and, and Jews in particular, are the only ones being isolated and punished, uh, I think is uh, highly deplorable. Your organization, uh, once again, is the Lawfare Project. If people want more information, where can they go to get that information about what you're trying to, to do to uh, stand up to this kind of anti-Semitism and, and boycotting of, of Jewish-made products? 
so first of all, I just want to point out that you're absolutely right that so far the policy in Europe and labeling has only targeted Israel. But again, it has opened up uh, the opportunity that now products from anywhere, including Hamas-controlled Gaza, can be labeled as such. So we shall see how the regulation is going to be applied. Um, and again, the fight is not over. And so we will not give up at the Lawfare Project. We will continue to fight the discriminatory application of the decision on a country-by-country basis. Um, you can find us at www.thelawfareproject.org. Lawfare is spelled L-A-W-F as in Frank, A-R-E, Lawfare Project. And with your help and support, we will succeed uh, and defeat discrimination. Yes. I, I think what you're doing is very important uh, because uh, discrimination often doesn't just stop with one group or people. It spreads. Uh, and uh, this kind of anti-Semitism uh, is something that any of us who have any understanding of history, uh, we need to look at very seriously and take it very seriously. Uh, if both for the, the Jewish people being directly persecuted, uh, but also for other people around the world, including the United States, where this kind of pretextual uh, discrimination and bigotry could apply uh, to products made by Americans or others that uh, should not be treated differently and unequally uh, just because of their nationality or where they're from. So, And not only, not only that, just I want to mention, technically a consumer can now you know, bring a lawsuit saying that an item produced in the United States indicate whether the manufacturer supports President Trump or not, because it's relevant to consumers. Right, um, right, Europeans right. Europeans need to, to remember what happens when you start labeling Jewish products does not end in a very good place. They should learn from their history. Very good. Thank you once again, uh, Bert Goldstein, for the work that you're doing and for being on the program. Thank you so much for having me and for highlighting the issue. Our pleasure. One of my most memorable experiences was a girl who came in who was 18, felt like the only choice she had was abortion. She had her boyfriend and her family members telling her, this is what you need to do. But she really wanted deep down to keep the child, but she thought she had no other choice. And through counseling, through sitting with her and talking about her options, through the ultrasound, she eventually chose life for her child. Alpha is a pregnancy medical clinic and what we do is we do uh, counseling for girls that are, find themselves in crisis pregnancies. One of my volunteers found out that there was a, a space for lease in a building, a medical building in Vacaville. We knew that that building had Planned Parenthood in it. It also had um, two other places that we actually refer clients to, Community Care Clinic and also Vacaville Imaging. So it was a great fit for us. And we know that our clients, our potential clients, are going to Planned Parenthood. So we thought, well, we'll check it out. So the board president and I went to check it out. And when we went with the realtor in the building, Little did we know till we got there, because there were two spaces for lease, the one that he showed us was directly across the hall from Planned Parenthood, literally three feet from their door. And when we saw that, we thought, you know, that's got to be God. When a girl walks down the hall, the image that I got is she can go left or she can go right. And even the realtor at the time asked me if we would have a problem being across from Planned Parenthood. And I said, well, no, that's what choice is all about, isn't it? So we entered into an agreement with the landlord. The lease went back and forth a couple times. Uh, the landlord themselves wrote the lease for the building and sent it to us. I signed it and I returned it to the realtor with the check uh, for first and last month's rent that they asked for. And then two days later, I received a call from the realtor. Um, I could tell he was uncomfortable when he called me and he said, uh, I've never had this happen before, but the landlord actually sent your check and the lease back and said that um, the deal is off. When the realtor gave us a reason in his letter, he said that they didn't like the terms of the lease, even though they're the ones that wrote the lease, and that we weren't a good fit for the building. 
We contacted the Pacific Justice Institute to help us in this case, and now we've filed suit against them. Nonprofit charities that help women choose life deserve to be treated fairly and equally. And that's why we at Pacific Justice Institute have filed this lawsuit to make sure that they get exactly that kind of treatment. Well, it's important because we had to go through the same licensing as any other medical clinic in the state of California. And yet, for some reason, Alpha is not a good fit for the building. I believe God created us and uh, we're given life. We're, we were designed by a creator. We all are very thankful our mothers chose life. And we feel every girl that is pregnant should be allowed to see an ultrasound of what's happening inside of her body and make an informed decision. We know that we can't make the choice for her, but we do know that with ultrasound about 90% of clients will end up choosing life for their child. And folks, uh, if you'd like to support the Pacific Justice Institute, become an actual part of our team, uh, just go to our website. It's pji.org, P for Pacific, J for Justice, I for Institute, .org. And we have an end-of-year matching gift program. Uh, so it's a great opportunity uh, to participate in supporting the work of the Pacific Justice Institute. We also have some very valuable resources, including opt-out forms to protect your children uh, from what's going on in, in public schools across the country, uh, as well as uh, information on how to protect your children from being wrongfully taken by a zealous social worker. That's a real problem also we're seeing across the country, along with other resources as well. So go to our website, pji.org. P for Pacific, J for Justice, I for Institute.org, and your gift and support is tax deductible. Now, we have with us here on the line one of our attorneys, who the attorney who heads up our office there in, in the state of Oregon, uh, Ray Hackey. Ray, uh, thank you for joining us on the program. Glad to be here, Brad. Now, Ray, we've got a case up there uh, dealing with a gentleman who is sharing his faith in a shopping mall uh, in a nonviolent way, non-threatening way, just sharing his faith in a shopping mall, and he's arrested. So tell us about this individual. I understand his name is Stephen Francis. Tell us about Stephen. All right. Well, Jesus said, go forth and bring my message to all nations. Stephen's a guy who's really taken that message to heart. Wherever he goes, whether it's to the mall, a sports event, or even to court, he brings gospel tracts with him. Uh, if you pass within arm's length of him, he's going to try to give you one. So he's that passionate about sharing the transforming love of Jesus with others. Right, and and he does so in a, in a loving way uh, that's respectful of people, but he just can't hold back his faith and his desire to share the gospel. Boy, I, you know, Ray, frankly, I wish, I wish we all had that. I mean, I think if believers had that kind of, of zeal uh, to share their faith, this country, this world would be such a greater place to be. So Stephen is someone really committed to sharing his faith. Uh, he has uh, no problem uh, with uh, reaching out to people with the love of Christ and with, with his gospel tracts. Um, what exactly happened in August that caused him to get arrested? What exactly happened? I want people to understand uh, the tyranny that we're talking about here that that's took place here in the state of Oregon. Right. Well, Stephen went to a mall in Clackamas County, which is a suburb of Portland. Uh, he planned to grab some dinner and shop, and he wanted a witness to others while he was there. He found a willing listener in, like, minutes. Uh, they were having a peaceful conversation when a security guard saw Stephen holding his tracks. Uh, the security guard came up and told Stephen, you can't do that here. When Stephen asserted his right uh, to do what he was doing, the security guard became angry and ordered him to leave. So now, okay, so he was at a, a, a private shopping mall. Uh, some are going to hear this and say, well, wait a minute, he's, he's on private property. Uh, how can he claim any right to uh, be able to give someone a gospel tract if it's on private property. That would be the argument of some, some people out there. Uh, what say you? 
Well, Oregon courts recognize that malls are as much places of social interaction as they are places of business. They've kind of replaced the old-time marketplaces uh, in public squares as traditional public forums. Oregon law is thus clear that the more a business owner opens his business to the public, the less free a business owner is uh, to restrict free speech on its property. Uh, that also, that law also prohibits religious discrimination. Yeah. Now, I think it's important for people to understand, Ray, that that this is what is applied to Oregon law. I think there's about seven states, including California as well, that have these kinds of uh, provisions for people to be able to share their faith in on privately owned property where it's open to the public. And here we're talking about maybe like the common eating area of a shopping mall, uh, something that is is made to function like a enclosed public park, if you will, for interaction of, you know, free uh, visiting and talking and et cetera. Uh, we're not talking about him being in a in an actual store where he's just out, you know, passing out gospel tracts. Uh, indiv- actual store owners have much more discretion than a shopping mall that has been where the area has been opened up to the public, right? That's correct. Okay, so he's in that. He's not in the little individual store. He's in the open area of the shopping mall, like everyone else, talking, visiting. Um, he's sharing his faith, you know offering people a gospel track. And so he's, yeah, I, I see nothing wrong with that. We at Pacific Justice have represented people like that before who've been treated like criminals. Uh, and yet, um, you know, that's, that's what happened to him. I mean, you know, he asserts his rights to evangelize uh, he, and yet he's ordered to leave. Uh, how did things escalate from there? Well, Stephen complied with the security guard's order, mainly because the guy was beyond reasoning with. When he got outside, Stephen saw another security guard and was asked to speak to a super and asked to speak to a supervisor. Stephen wanted to know more about mall policy and who to talk to about how he'd been treated. Before he knows it, three more security guards show up. Two of them claim to be supervisors. Uh, they make some lame excuses about how sharing his religious beliefs is solicitation, which is the mall mall's code, which the mall's code of conduct does not prohibit Whoa. or even mention one of the security guards eventually radios the cops the police come and arrest Stephen for a second degree criminal trespass <laughs> i mean he was trying to find out if this was a valid policy which i can understand i mean if someone just tells you well yeah you can visit in a, in a shopping area uh in a in an open place uh in a food court yeah you can talk and share but you better not share your religion. You better not say the J word or the G word or we're going to arrest you. That's basically the message that he got. And instead of just giving him that information, they went ahead, called the police, had him arrested. I mean, was he uh, making any threats? Did he try to hit any of the security guards? Was he trying to uh, uh, threaten them in any way? Uh, no, not at all. And that's why when Stephen told me this story, I couldn't help but laugh. I mean, seriously, doesn't the mall any ha- have any real troubles to deal with, troublemakers to deal with? I mean, shoplifters, unruly teenagers, anything like that? You know, it wasn't like Stephen was preventing stores and eateries at the mall from doing business. He posed no threat to the comfort or safety of others. He wasn't even bothering anyone. If someone doesn't want to talk to him, he lets them go on their merry way. Uh, if Stephen was harassing people, that would be different. But that's not what happened here. Right. Okay. So what did they actually charge him with? What What actually was their excuse for arresting him? Uh, they, they arrested him for second degree criminal, criminal trespass. Wow. Second degree criminal trespass. Now, he was invited like everyone else in the community to, to be in that shopping mall. And they asked him to leave. He did step outside. Um, so the fact, it really what it boils down to is just, it's because he was caught sharing his faith. And now he was not just simply removed from the property. He's actually being criminally prosecuted. So he's being prosecuted for second degree criminal trespass. I mean, good night. This is outrageous. And the fact that 
this could happen to anyone uh, who wants to share their faith. What, what are we looking at here? I mean, what are, what are we at Pacific Justice Institute doing right now to protect and defend him uh, in criminal court? I, I mean, just saying this sounds strange to me. In criminal court for sharing his faith, what are we doing to, to defend him and represent him? Well, thankfully, uh, the county is not prosecuting him. Uh, however, uh, the mall security did give him notice that he was banned for the, from the mall for a year. Banned for sharing his faith and giving a gospel tract to someone. Um, he's been banned for a year. And now it's good they dropped the charges, but I mean, he, he was, this guy was arrested, had criminal charges brought against him. I mean, that's pretty intimidating for doing something for which you're supposed to be protected to be able to do. And what you're being attacked for is simply sharing your faith. Uh, if he was, if he was giving out Ray, if he was giving out information about a football game, wasn't selling anything, just giving out information, uh, that that would probably have been okay. It's really because he was sharing his faith, wasn't it? Yes, unfortunately. Uh, and that's why we reached out to the company that owns the mall. Uh, we've demanded that the company rescind his banishment and amend its code of conduct to make clear that people are free to exercise their free speech rights there. And, right. and that includes religious speech. Right. Uh, Stephen's not after any money. Uh, he just wants to be able to go back and tell others about Jesus. Right. If the mall's owner does not respond, or if it refuses to comply with our demands, we will go on the offensive and file a lawsuit. Right. Well, and as we should. And um, that's what we're here for, is to stand up for people like Stephen, uh, who want to be able to share their faith, live their faith in the United States of America. Uh, Ray, I appreciate the work that you're doing. I encourage people out there to be praying for Ray and his client, Stephen, as we uh, try to get this matter resolved. But if we, if we have to, we'll go to court, as we should. Ray, God bless you and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you, Brad. So folks, there you have it. It's our God-given freedoms we're talking about. Now, let's choose to keep them. I'm Brad Dacus, president of the Pacific Justice Institute. Have a great weekend.